So hello, I am Katherine Moore from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, and uh, today I'm going to tell you about a file system we're developing to support scientific applications on HPC systems. It's called UnifyFS. This uh, effort is supported by the United States Exascale Computing Project, uh, joint work currently between Lawrence Livermore and Oak Ridge National Laboratories and NCSA. And down at the bottom of the slide, you can see the names of the current team members um, who are all working on this effort. Um, the easiest way to think about UnifyFS, it's a file system that we've developed to make using node local storage or node local burst buffers easy and fast. And so to give you an idea of what I mean by easy, if you uh, look at this code snippet that's on your screen, um, on the left-hand side, we have the main function of a program, you know, typical for an HPC application, MPI program, and it has a major time step loop um, as uh, its main loop. And in each time step, it does some simulation work, and then it takes a checkpoint. And then on the right-hand side, you see the checkpointing code. Um, uh, you know, first it specifies file name, uh, opens the file, writes the file, and then closes it. Uh, and then you'll see that we've commented out the line where um, it used to specify a path to um, slash PFS, which in this example is meant to represent the parallel file system. Um, and all the user really has to do is replace that path with uh, slash UnifyFS, which is the mount point for UnifyFS. So it's easy. And our other goal is to make it fast. And so here are some scaling results using UnifyFS on Summit. On the um, x-axis, we have increasing number of processes, all writing to a single shared file. And on the y-axis, we have aggregate bandwidth across all those processes. The different color bars represent different ways of using UnifyFS. Um, First of all, when we're talking about uh, writing to RAM, the first storage location that UnifyFS uses for file data is main memory. But since main memory is a limited resource, uh, users can specify a boundary on how much memory we use. And then once we reach that boundary uh, with file data, uh, we spill over to uh, a burst buffer, or in this case, it says SSD. And then the difference between write and batched write is that write is a single write operation and batched refers to um, batched IO using uh, POSIX list IO commands. <clears throat> and the take home here is that, um, you know, as you're adding processes to your job, you're getting scalable uh, performance in you know, FS. So, you know, why do we need UnifyFS? Um, you know, we have parallel file systems, we spend a lot of money on them, and, um, you know, they've served us well, and I, and I agree with that. However, I think we've all experienced um, problems with parallel file system slowdown where your job uh, ends up uh, spending more time in I.O. than you expect. And the reason for this is largely a classic contention problem. The parallel file system is a shared resource um, across all the jobs running on the cluster you're running on, um, as well as um, jobs running on uh, other clusters in your compute center, um, because typically we share parallel file systems across clusters um, for convenience so you can access your data. So there's contention, which means that, you know, your job could uh, experience IO slowdowns as, you know, or IO operations lasting as long as tens of minutes where, you know, your application is blocked, it's not making any forward progress. So, um, so that's not good. Um, another reason that parallel file systems can um, have a slower performance is they support what is called general purpose file system semantics. And what this means is that the parallel file system protects your data from just about any kind of I.O. operation that could happen at any time. So if you have um, many processes running on the system and, you know, process zero wants to access a region of the file and process 100 also wants to access that region of the file, the parallel file system implementation guarantees that you will end up with a consistent result, even though those two processes are trying to access the same 
region at the same time. And that's great. Nobody wants corrupted data. However, um, this protection isn't always strictly necessary for high performance computing applications because of the way they do IO and uh, the locking that is required to support these kind of um, protections can be expensive. Oh my, so I'm having the same problem with um, <laughs> runaway slides. Um, so let's see if we can make this um, work properly. Okay, so, oopsie, this will be fun. So system designers have introduced new layers of storage into high performance computing systems. And um, we've typically called them burst buffers in recent years. And there's two different models that we see out in the wild today. Uh, the first we call a local burst buffer model. And this means that the storage devices are local to a compute node. They're not shared. Um, and then they're, um, we see this implementation on machines like Summit at Oak Ridge or Sierra at Livermore. And then there's a shared burst buffer model, which um, there are larger um, storage devices that are shared by a group of compute nodes where this could they, excuse me, where the shared burst buffer could be allocated dynamically um, by the resource manager or perhaps statically. And we see this implementation in machines like Cori at NERSC or Trinity at Los Alamos. Okay, both of these models have their pros and cons. Um, the good part about the local burst buffer model is um, that it's fast, it's right on the compute node, there's no contention problems because you're not sharing that compute node with any other jobs, uh, so therefore you're not sharing your storage resources with any other jobs. And it has the potential for excellent scaling performance because as you're adding compute nodes to your job, you're automatically adding storage resources. Uh, the shared burst buffer model, on the other hand, is, is similar in concept to um, a mini parallel file system. So this is great um, because it's convenient for applications that uh, write shared files. So lots of applications use things like MPIO or HDF5 um, that support shared file IO. And also it's easy for producer consumer applications. Um, so by this I mean uh, in a single job, you might run multiple components of an application that communicate through files. A classic example of this would be a climate model where maybe ocean produces a file that the atmosphere component reads in. So shared burst buffer model works well for that. Uh, so both of these also have their cons. Um, so the lo local burst buffer model uh, does not work well for shared files. So these are uh, the devices are local to each compute node. So if, you know, process zero writes some data on node zero that is not visible to um, process four on node four. Um, and it is also equally challenging for producer consumer applications. Um, uh, for shared burst buffer models, um, it's not quite as fast as node local. It's not attached to the compute node. So, you know, there's network traffic at the very least, but also contention could be an issue depending on how uh, the, the burst buffers are allocated to the jobs. For UnifyFS, what we are targeting is the issues uh, related to using local burst buffer model, excuse me, local burst buffers for um, applications that want to use shared files. So to motivate why we like the burst, uh, local burst buffer model, here are some performance results um, sh showing scaling uh, for IO operations. So these are from two different machines from Livermore. And on the x-axis, we're increasing the number of nodes that are doing IO operations. And on the y-axis, we have aggregate bandwidth on log scale. Uh, the blue and green lines on each graph represent um, IO operations to some kind of node local storage. So there's either RAM disk in main memory or SSD a burst buffer. And the orange brown line represents the performance of the parallel file system. So right away, what you probably see is that the performance of the parallel file system does pretty well at first, but as you add more and more compute nodes and processes to your job, at some point you reach the uh, saturation point of the parallel file system performance and you just can't get any better than that. Um, that's all the parallel par 
file system can deliver. But then in contrast, looking at the blue and green lines, you know, they scale as you add more compute nodes to your job. So you're getting uh, always getting improved, um, increasing bandwidth. Um, and so in our measurements, we found that, you know, these could be as much as a thousand times faster on Atlas or 300 times faster on Lassen. And I, I do want to point out that these measurements were not taken with UnifyFS. They were taken with a sister project called the SCR or Scalable Checkpoint Restart Library. And, um, and actually, SCR was the inspiration for the development of UnifyFS. But in the inter interest of time, I won't tell that story. But if you're curious, um, please ask me in the Q&A. OK, because uh, node local storage is fast, we want to make using it easy for uh, shared file applications. So what we do is we just create a named mount point across the burst buffers in your job, in this example, slash UnifyFS. And then you can use that just like you would any other file system mount point uh, to do I.O. Uh, you can use it directly from your application if you're using, say, something like POSIX I.O. or indirectly through high-level I.O. libraries like HDF5 or checkpointing libraries like SCR or Veloci. Our other goal is to make UnifyFS fast, and we do this by tailoring the way UnifyFS behaves specifically for HPC workloads. Uh, examples of this would be a checkpoint restart pattern or may maybe regular outputs. The other reason UnifyFS is fast is because each UnifyFS instance only exists for your job. So that means you're not sharing UnifyFS with um, other jobs on the system. So you will get a contention-free um, uh, performance. Here's a high-level overview of how UnifyFS can work in your job. So when you want to run your application, you uh, modify your job script to get UnifyFS started and then at the end terminate. And then between start and terminate, you run your application or you enter your uh, commands to run your application like you normally would. And then you submit your batch script to the resource manager. And then when the commands in the batch script are executed, UnifyFS will be started up for your job. And so the mount point will be available, and then your application can do uh, whatever I.O. it's going to do. It could be shared file I.O., process I.O., could use high-level libraries like MPI I.O. or SCR. And then uh, the I.O. operations will be intercepted by UnifyFS and, um, and managed. So I said um, that UnifyFS optimizes its behavior based on how HPC applications do I.O. So I want to walk through what is typical for HPC applications and, and how we came to um, the conclusions we came for UnifyFS. So left-hand side, we have a typical skeleton of an HPC application. Um, MPI program, first thing it does is it reads its input to get going has one main time step loop in each time step does simulation work. Uh, after that, it does some communication or synchronization and then writes some output. On the right hand side, the circles represent compute nodes and the little squares represent the data that is owned by the processes running on that compute node. And then the cylinders are the parallel file system. So the first thing we notice is that reads and writes occur in distinct phases. So at the first, at the beginning of the program, the application is reading input, and uh, periodically through the execution, it will be writing output. But you don't typically see reads and writes being interleaved. It's just one or the other. The other behavior is that reads and writes are performed to regular offsets in a shared file. Um, so granted, the offsets or regularity may not be as regular as I'm showing in this slide, uh, but they will still be regular and computable. So um, this would be in contrast to something like a database application where you know, the reads and writes could be randomly distributed across the file and occur at any time. 
And the last observation we make is that when reading, and this is especially true for checkpoint restart workloads, a process will most likely need the data that it wrote. So if you think about it, when rank zero um, writes its checkpoint data, and then there's a, a crash and everything fails, uh, the data that rank zero is going to need to restart um, is probably the data it wrote. And um, our observations are that these behaviors are typical of many HPC workloads, uh, including checkpoint restart, periodic output like visualization files, um, reading of input decks, uh, producer consumer workloads like the climate model we talked about earlier. Okay, so based on those observations, we developed um, a semantic scheme in UnifyFS that we're calling lamination semantics. And if you're not familiar with the uh, process of lamination, I've got some pictures on the bottom to describe it. Uh, you take something important to you, like you know your wedding photos or something like that, and you want to make sure that this document is protected. So you take what's called a lamination sleeve, which is two pieces of plastic, and you put your document in it inside of the sleeve. And then you feed that sleeve into a machine that melts the edges of the plastic. Um, so now your document is protected. Uh, it's encased in plastic. It's sealed in there. So you can spill your coffee on it. Um, you know, it's not going to be altered. Um, the other thing about the laminated document is that now you can't change it. So it's it's um, read only. And so we are taking that uh, metaphor uh, into UnifyFS. So when you're writing a file before lamination occurs, um, you can uh, modify it in any way that you want to. Uh, but before lamination, um, we limit um, the visibility of data to different processes. Uh, so you for example, you may not see a process may not be able to see uh, data written by a process on another node. So once uh, write operations are all done, uh, the application will initiate the lamination process, and then UnifyFS will render the file read only, so it's like encasing it in plastic, and all the data is synchronized across the um, the nodes in the job, and so now uh, there's complete visibility of the final state of the file to jobs, or excuse me, to all processes. And the reason we go to all this trouble is uh, for performance. So um, to give you an idea of what I mean, uh, in the chart here at the bottom, we're increasing the number of nodes all writing to a shared file, or well, in this case, it's reading. And we're showing uh, bandwidth and log scale on the y-axis. And the different color bars represent um, uh, different needs of applications for accessing data before lamination. So the darkest green is our original strategy where um, processes can see uh, data on any node before lamination, the, uh, or any node, any process. Uh, the middle represents where processes need to be able to read data from only processes on their local node uh, before lamination. And then the final bar is a strategy for when processes only need to access the data that they wrote. So this is the optimized for checkpoint restart strategy. And so you can see with um, weakened need for um, global synchronization of data that we can get better and better performance, and especially for when a process only needs its local data. Okay, so I'm going to run quickly how to use UnifyFS so you can get an idea of how it works. This won't be a full tutorial, don't worry. Hi. It's exciting. Maybe I should just... Um Okay, so the easiest way to build Unify to build UnifyFS is to use a tool called SPAC. Um, we have a lot of documentation on how to build. Um, if you're not familiar with SPAC, uh, please check it out. To modify your application for UnifyFS, and this is for an MPI application, um, 
it's a uh, typical skeleton, uh, and all this NPI program is doing is opening a file, writing hello world, and then closing it. And you'll notice that it's writing to slash luster, which is meant to represent the parallel file system. To use UnifyFS, uh, first of all, you need to change the mount point to uh, point to UnifyFS. And uh, then finally, what you need to do in our current implementation is uh, laminate the file with the chmod. And I will say our current implementation because we were busy working on uh, different methods to laminate. Um, and, and we would like for them to be transparent as much as possible. So uh, the first method would be lamination automatically whenever a file is closed. Another option would be to <coughs> laminate when the file system is unmounted. So everything in the UnifyFS file system would be laminated and um, ready for transfer. Or we will provide a uh, API call uh, for explicit lamination, UnifyFS laminate, in case an application needs um, better control. So we'll have you know, two uh, uh, transparent methods and one explicit method, and you would be able to choose what kind of behavior you want uh, when you start up UnifyFS. Okay, <laughs> I'm gonna give up here. Okay, um, uh, let's see. I skipped through some slides, but this is the punchline. Uh, you know, to get UnifyFS running in your batch script, you need to, um, the easiest way to do it, there are several ways to do it, but this is the easiest way, is to uh, use the UnifyFS utility to start the UnifyFS file system before you run your application. And then uh, the JS run hello is to you know run your your application and then unify fs terminate after you're done and so the start and terminate commands will uh, get unify fs launched and also torn down we have three different methods for moving your data in and out of unify fs because the whole reason you're writing your data is because you would like it at the end right uh, so first of all we have a transfer program with um, a pattern similar to something like copy where you transfer source destinations, you can move files in or out of UnifyFS and you can put this in your batch script. We have a transfer API that you could use within your code if you need fine-grained control over um, what UnifyFS is doing. And then also you can uh, provide options to the UnifyFS utility uh, to stage in data and stage out data. So stage in comes before your application uh, runs and then stage out is at termination time. We would love it if you would check out UnifyFS. Uh, we have read the docs um, documentation. We're a fairly new project. Uh, in the world of uh, file systems, we've been together about three years. So uh, we're still changing things quite a lot so we request that when you do check out the documentation if you see where the arrow is pointing you change the version to be the latest version uh, so that you get the most up-to-date uh, information on UnifyFS. Um, we would love to have your feedback like I said we're an early project so if you know if we if you think something is missing uh, that you would like um, for your application uh, please let us know uh, you can find us on GitHub. You can email us at unifyfs at exascaleproject.org. And thank you. Okay, thanks a lot for, for this presentation. So you have triggered uh, some interest, if I can see uh, from the question list. So the first one will be, um, uh, first, I will say a relation with the existing uh, work. Uh, how would you characterize um, uh, UnifyFS in respect of PLFS? Oh, okay. Oh. Right. So PLFS was um, optimized for the output case. So, you know, very similar to uh, what we're doing um, that, you know, applications typically, uh, you know, bulk synchronously output data, and you know if you have no local storage, it's faster than the parallel file system. Um, the difference, I'd say the, the biggest difference is that um, we're also um, taking the reading um, 
account into into play. So my recollection of PLFS is that uh, to read, maybe I'm wrong and maybe my information is out of date, so someone please jump in, um, was that you, it had to come from the parallel file system or there was another step involved. So the other question is, so the, the process of lamination actually uh, apparently is, is triggering a lot of, of questions. So <laughs> maybe Julian, you can express your question uh, in a better way than me. All right. Um, so the first question I suppose would be regarding the term lamination. Uh, I was just thinking, was there a specific, maybe there's a specific interesting history to it or you had your choice because there are other alternatives, you know, like make immutable or finalize or whatever, right? And uh, I just worry a bit about now from the user perspective, if they would understand what does lamination mean. Yeah, you explain it nicely. Um, but uh, I just, you know, wonder. I'm, I'm with you, Julian. Um, and to be perfectly honest, we're still um, working out what we what the rules are for lamination semantics. So the, the name came up um, because we had an idea that we you know, wanted to support um, these particular behaviors of HPC applications, um, uh, but you know, didn't have a clear grasp on it. And we thought that this read-only um, lamination process would be key to it. And, um, and so one of our team members uh, came up with the idea and we haven't come up with a better name since. So, <laughs> so um, I agree it can be confusing uh, because it's not a standard term. Uh, I think another reason we chose it from, say, a standard term is because we wanted the flexibility of being able to uh, work things out as, as we're figuring it out. Yep, understand fully. <laughs> So there is one comment, one suggestion from Glenn uh, about switching uh, lamination to sync. Would you think it makes sense? Or there well, some, uh... Uh, so uh, different levels of visibility are triggered by sync. So um, it, the green chart on the screen, um, in, actually in order for the, the data to be visible to anything other than a local process, there needs to be a sync operation. But it's it's um, not as what am I trying to say? <clears throat> it's similar, but not as complete as lamination. So so you know, I guess it's a, a partial lamination on sync, and then we're reserving uh, lamination for you know we're done. Uh, we can optimize the layout of the file uh, across the compute nodes now. Um, and things like that. So at this point, we think that two stages is is what we want. We may change our mind in a year. <laughs> One last question, very last question about lamination. Um, is it only about the data, or is it also about the metadata of the file? So. Okay. So. Um, all right. So metadata by that, and we don't keep full metadata like, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Like, you know, modification time and things like that. Um, and we don't actually support um, directories within UnifyFS strictly yet. Um, so in that regard, it's just the file data. So just a comment from me, I would think basically it is like um, PLFS, to grab this, plus the migration in and out. Yeah, that could be a way to think about it. <laughs>